So welcome everyone to ReFed's webinar series, Following the Roadmap to 2030, Taking Action to Reduce U.S. Food Waste by 50%. This is the third of a seven part series that digs deeper into the data and solutions highlighted in ReFed's Roadmap to 2030 and the ReFed Insights Engine. Each installment is based on one of the seven key action areas in the Roadmap to 2030. As we host each new installment every month between now and November, We'll not only walk you through what the data is telling us, but we'll also be assembling a team of experts who can really help us bring the data to life through their lived experiences and expertise. So if you haven't already done so, I'd encourage you to all sign up for the remaining installments of the series. We'll put that registration link in the chat box for you as well. I also wanna take, take a moment to recognize our really wonderful media partner for the series, Food Tank. I'm sure many of you know who they are, but for those who don't, Food Tank works to educate, inspire, advocate, and create change in the food system. You can find them at foodtank.com. That's F-O-O-D-T-A-N-K.com. And we sincerely thank them for collaborating with us. Our previous webinars covered the first two key action areas in the roadmap to 2030, optimize the harvest and enhance product distribution. Today, today we'll be exploring the third key action area, refine product management. Before we get started, I've got a couple of questions for you all. Um, so first off, I'm curious to find out what your role is in the food system. And then second, I'd like to learn um, if your role is directly related to product management. So I'll give you about 20, 25 seconds to respond to those. All right, so it looks like we've got an interesting mix, lots of solution providers, quite a few policymakers, and a lot of others. That's great. We ourselves fall into really another category here at ReFed. Um, and also a, a very clean split, actually, in terms of folks uh, with product management directly in your role. We've got 25% saying yes and 75% saying no. So really interesting results there and um, helps provide some context for this conversation. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, regardless of whether your role is directly related to product management, I think you're going to find some really interesting information from our panelists um, that's going to be valuable to how you think about product management, balancing supply and demand, and, and all these different components that um, fit into it. Uh, but before I introduce our fabulous panelists, I want to take a few minutes to familiarize everyone with ReFed and lay some groundwork for what we mean when we say refined product management. As most of you probably already know, ReFed is a national nonprofit working to end food loss and waste across the U.S. food system by advancing data-driven solutions. Our vision, like yours I'm sure, is a sustainable, inclusive, and resilient food system that makes the best use of the food that we grow. One of the things we do at ReFed is try to facilitate action among our stakeholders. We're known for our food waste data and solutions, but how can we help people use that information to take action? One of the ways that we do that is through events like this today. And if you want to participate in more ReFed events and activities in the future, I encourage you to sign up for the brand new ReFed Food Waste Action Network. It's an evolution of our previous expert network and other groups that we've hosted, and it's designed to inspire real action and collaboration between individuals and organizations from across the food system. Today's event is open to everyone but we will be hosting some exclusive events that are for the ReFed Food Waste Action Network members only. Members can participate in a range of opportunities like our Lunch and Learns, Innovation Demo Days, to network and to gain and share information on food waste. It is free to join and you can do so by using the link you see on the screen or by emailing us at insights at refed.com. And we'll also put that link in the chat box for you. We hope that you'll join this amazing network and feel free to share this information with anyone else that you think would be interested. Now, many, as many of you know, in February of this year, ReFed introduced two new and free resources that are available, available right now on our website, the ReFed Insights Engine and the Roadmap to 2030. These resources help support the food system's efforts to cut food waste by 50% by the year 2030. The Insights Engine is an online hub for data and insights about food waste, 
featuring a detailed cost benefit analysis of more than 40 food waste reduction solutions, estimates on the causes and impacts of food waste in the US and within each state, built from analyzing more than 50 public and proprietary data sets, a directory of over 800 solution providers ready to partner on food waste reduction initiatives, and more. We also introduced an updated version of our 2016 Roadmap to Reduce U.S. Food Waste called the Roadmap to 2030. It introduces a new framework with seven key action areas to help guide the food system in taking action to achieve our common 2030 reduction goal, each of which is a monthly discussion focus for this webinar series. Within the seven key action areas, we've analyzed more than 40 solutions along with their impact potential. Refed's analysis shows that by implementing these solutions with an annual investment of approximately 14 billion, we'd see a reduction of 45 million tons of food waste. That's more than half of what's currently generated each year. And there's a range of other benefits like greenhouse gas emission reductions, reducing food waste as one of the top solutions for climate change mitigation. There would also be water savings, meals recovered and jobs created. And the net financial benefit for all of this would be approximately 73 billion each year. And that's what this webinar series is about. Our goal is to get all this information off the page and bring it to life so that it can support your food waste reduction efforts. So when we say refine product management, what we mean is aligning purchases with sales as closely as possible. And when surplus does arise, finding secondary outlets to accommodate it. It also means building out systems and processes for optimal on-site handling. Product management happens throughout the supply chain. So reducing waste when you're handling or storing products is an important consideration for a range of stakeholders. This is information from Refed's Insights Engine. This shows that at the retail level, 50% of unsold food is due to date label concerns. That's not necessarily food with safety issues, but rather it reflects food that's typically removed from shelves two, three days ahead of the listed date. Ideally, this number would go down as retailers continue to improve product management. The second highest cause, as you can see, of unsold food at retail is handling issues. That's another 20% of surplus food right there. So as you go through the list of causes of surplus food, you can see just how critical getting a handle on product management is. And I think it's important to note here that this is a great example of how what happens at one stage of the supply chain can have a direct bearing on what happens at the others, either upstream or downstream. Our discussion last month focused on enhancing product distribution to help ensure freshness and maximize selling time. And if that's not happening, then retailers and food service operations that are receiving a product are already starting from a deficit. Our insights engine analysis shows that by improving product management processes, we can divert 4.6 million tons of food waste annually, plus we can cut greenhouse gas emissions by 14.2 million metric tons, and save more than 850 billion gallons of water each year. The product management solutions we've detailed on the insights engine would take approximately 3.9 billion each year to implement, but there'd be an annual estimated financial benefit of 15.8 billion. That is a four to one return in the billions. That's pretty huge. So how can we take meaningful action to do this? What you're seeing on the screen now are some of the top solutions for refining product management based on net financial benefit and total food waste tons diverted. This information also came from Refed's Insights Engine but we've also ranked solutions based on other impact metrics like greenhouse gas, em gas emissions, water saved, and meals recovered. You'll see that our solutions include enhanced demand planning, waste tracking, markdown alert applications, dynamic pricing, and minimized on-hand inventory. We'll be talking about some of those today, as well as other solutions like assist distress sales and temperature monitoring. Now, before we dive in, I have one more poll question for the audience. This one is more of a fun quiz for you. What type of capital is most needed to scale these solutions? You've got four options there. And again, we'll give you about 20, 25 sec seconds to place your response.
All right, let's see how you did. All right, we got about almost half of folks said corporate finance and good job group. The correct answer is corporate finance. Refed estimates that nearly 65% of the financial investment in this action area should come from corporate finance and spending. That's because we're talking about operational changes, such as decreased transit time, first expired, first out models that will require corporations internal capital to, for example, purchase enabling equipment, pay service fees for solution providers, and change behaviors of employees through training and incentives. But there's also an important role for other capital types. Venture capital can help scale new product management technologies and solutions. Philanthropic funding through grants and impact first investments can help decrease risk for businesses and nonprofits. As we talk about financing though, it's important to reiterate here what I said a few minutes ago. Our analysis shows that there's an overall four to one return on investment for product management solutions. So what, of all, what does all of this actually mean on the ground? Well, that's what our panelists today will be discussing. And with that, I am excited to introduce them. Uh, so first up, we have Janet Haugen. Janet is Vice President of People Operations and Organizational Effectiveness at LeanPath. LeanPath offers food waste tracking solutions that make it easier for businesses to gather and use data to change processes to cut waste throughout their operations. Welcome, Janet. Matt Schwartz. Oh, sorry. Matt Schwartz is CEO and co-founder at Afresh Technologies. Afresh uses AI technology to help grocers reduce food waste, increase their profitability, and ultimately make fresh, nutrient-dense food more accessible. Welcome, Matt. Matt Seklecki is a retail inventory analyst at Giant Eagle, where he utilizes technology to identify opportunities, simplify processes, and improve communication within the organization. Giant Eagle is a supermarket chain with stores in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, Indiana, and Maryland. Welcome, Matt. And last but not least, we have Trevor Seek with us today. Trevor is Assistant Vice President and Relationship Manager for F&A Startups and Innovation at Rabobank, where he focuses on agricultural production technologies, food systems, venture design, and corporate innovation strategy. Hey, Trevor. Hi. Thanks to all of you for joining us and welcome. So to kick things off, I, you know, I've got a, a question for everyone and I'd love to start the conversation um, just by hearing you know, about your company and the work you're doing to refine product management as a way to reduce wasted food. Um, so would love to hear that. And then I'd also love to hear, you know, what are you most excited about on this topic? Um, so Janet, let's start with you. Then we'll do go to Matt Schwartz, Matt Seklecki and Trevor. Great, thanks so much, Katie, for the intro. Um, as Katie mentioned, I'm Janet. I work with Lean Path, and we're a B Corp with a mission to make food waste measurement and prevention everyday practice in the world's kitchens. So we fall into that waste measurement category um, within food service, and we created the food waste measurement and uh, prevention industry back in 2004. So we've been innovating since then, and today we offer a suite of food waste prevention programs that combine technology with data and behavior change platforms to help food service organizations of all sizes track their food waste, um, discover opportunities to increase efficiency, and ultimately cut their food waste in half or more. So we work with customers in over 40 countries. We're a global company um, cutting across multiple industries. We work within contract food service, college and university, um, corporate dining, healthcare and senior living, and hospitality. And some of our client partners include Google, Aramark, and Sodexo. Um, and our focus is really on the power of data, as Katie was talking about in the intro. So diving deep into what you're wasting and why to uncover opportunities to refine operations. Um, so very excited about this topic and joining the panelists. I think I'm most excited to hear about, even though we work across different industries and have different perspectives, some of those shared perspectives. And one of those is just uh, really the need for behavior change to drive any operational change within a, within a company. So thanks for having me. Wonderful. Matt Schwartz. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Katie. And a fresh, at a fresh, our mission is to eliminate food waste and make fresh, nutritious food accessible to all. And what we're doing is building the operating system and brain for the global fresh food industry. The company was really started on two big insights. The first was a belief that 
fresh food, produce, meat, seafood, baked goods, dairy, deli foods. We're really growing and strategically the most important segments within the growing food industry. And the second insight was that despite that importance, most if not all of the critical retail technology, supply chain technology, merchandising technology had been first built for processed foods that come in packages, have barcodes and last a very long time. And that that gap between fresh food and a lack of fresh technology combines to having critical decisions, many of which we'll talk about today in refining product management, that are done manually and even the largest multi-billion dollar organizations across the world. And the result of that in turn are these massive inefficiencies in the form of billions and billions of pounds of food waste, billions and billions of dollars of lost sales and more. And so what we're doing at Afresh specifically with our first product is building an end-to-end solution that optimizes the quantity of fresh foods that go into broader grocery stores to minimize waste and maximize profit. And I'm very excited to go deeper into that today um, and walk through some of how we've deployed that live now, ordering billions of dollars of produce at scale for our customers and seeing really significant reductions to their waste. And anything else you're, you're particularly excited about that you wanted to mention? I would reinforce what Janet said. I'm excited to take the conversation beyond just demand forecasting, beyond just optimization, but into, hey, how do you actually implement change that will reduce food waste and actually make it happen in reality? Wonderful. Matt Sekalecki would love to hear from you. Thanks, Katie. So I'm Matt Sicklucky, and I work for Giant Eagle. We're a privately owned retail supermarket and convenience chain with over 400 locations. Uh, and we use a variety of product management tools to reduce waste in our business. And that includes automated replenishment and fresh item production planning systems, uh, as well as partnerships with local food banks, food rescue programs, no moss tracking, and products reclamation and salvage process. Uh, we're also piloting programs that include personal pricing uh, as part of our loyalty program in, in a few markets. Um, so, you know, as an analyst, I think I'm most excited to see how we continue to develop and advance the capabilities of these systems to better meet customer needs along with decreasing waste. And Trevor, on to you. Great, thanks. So my name is Trevor. I'm part of Rabo Bank uh, North America. It's all a wholesale bank that's dedicated exclusively to food and agriculture sectors. Um, internally, my team is Food Bites. Uh, we're part of a global innovation team um, that represents uh, really Rabo Bank's overarching mission to grow a better world together. Um, and for us, this means understanding what are the emerging technologies that will be most impactful and how to support those technologies as they grow and expand into our network and the network of others um, that we also work with adjacent and in adjacent uh, industries. Um, so we work to connect these technologies to clients and investors in order to solve the world's most pressing challenges uh, that are confronting food and ag value chains. Um, we're particularly motivated by um, the work that the bank is doing around um, incentivizing impact. So how are they um, not only recognizing the changes that need to be made, the technologies that are impactful, but how are they incentivizing that? Um, and that takes different shapes and forms. Um, most recently, we have a creation of a, of a new loan that, that is fo food waste forward and focused. Um, we also have a carbon bank um, upon other initiatives that support uh, sustainability policies across the board. So really excited to be here today. Um, and probably what I'm most excited about is just understanding what are the pieces that can create the continuity needed for, for impact. So um, how do we take the human needs and the, and the behavior changes um, and associate that with, um, I guess, more in industry forward um, initiatives in order to actuate change. Wonderful. And then another question um, for everyone, and anyone can jump in on this one. 
you know, what are the persistent challenges that the food system is facing in terms of efficient food product management? What progress has been made and where do we really need some big improvements still? You know, what, what are some big levers that need to be pulled? I, I could jump in. I'm super biased, as I alluded to in my introduction, about fresh food in particular. And I think the challenges within fresh and food waste are particularly acute, given how perishable the product is just by way of its very nature. And I think one of the persistent challenges that exists across the food industry is the fact that we have a lot of technology and digital tools that have been built for non-perishable goods that have barcodes and that almost represent like a box of Cheerios almost acts like bits on a computer screen. It's easier to track, easier to understand inventory, easier and more predictable to manage. But fresh food is this whole organic dynamic thing that's dying from the moment you pick it from the vine or the tree or what have you. And it doesn't have a barcode. It doesn't have a best buy date. It doesn't have the same level of digitization and data cleanliness that exists in packaged foods or in things that aren't food at all. And as a result, managing products that have that level of complexity has been a persistent challenge for decades and decades now and results in those manual processes and inefficiencies, I think, that are the root cause of a lot, if not most of the food waste that we see. So the summary of all of that would be injecting technology in a dynamic real world scenario with products that don't necessarily lend themselves to being handled really well with technology and digital tools is a, is a big challenge. That, that's a great one and one we encounter a lot too. And you know, Janet, Matt Seklicki and Trevor, I'm curious if that comes up in y'all's line of work as well. And, and Matt Seklicki, I'm sure definitely in the retail section, you've got big produce sections. Um, you know, how are y'all handling fresh and, and what does that look like in your work? Yeah, I think uh, Matt brings up some really good points uh, where fresh items present the greatest amount of challenge to track, especially tracking the loss in those items. It's easy to, uh, to track the barcode going out the door, but not necessarily all the different ways uh, that we can lose fresh products along its path from raw ingredients to a finished product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we look at in, in the food service context in terms of waste tracking is um, prevention can often be like kind of an invisible thing and we're trying to make it visible because um, really understanding what's going to waste and why and under what operational conditions, um, so understanding the root causes that are driving that waste and that inefficiency and then making changes to production or purchases or what have you to make sure that that doesn't occur again in the future. Um, prevention can kind of often get ignored because it's not as tangible as some of the other solutions, but ultimately it's the, the best way um, from a, both a financial and um, an environmental perspective to make sure that, that those foods aren't spoiling in the kitchen, you know, they're not reaching their expiration date before they can be used, and you have the data to really understand what those opportunities are. And yeah, and I, I was just answering this question, I think, through the lens of all the startups and, and innovators that we see. So, you know, really thinking about um, data as a, as a standard um, and trying to push for continuity, um, we see as, as one of the bigger challenges uh, prevailing in terms of, um, you know, how, uh, you know, startup innovators tend to be um, systems thinkers and, and generally uh, try and reinvent um, the wheel quite often. So how do we uh, create more space for collaboration? How do we create more standardization that aren't, isn't proprietary um, as we move, uh, you know, unique and novel data solutions or, you know, solutions for fresh, for instance, um, towards a pathway for, for wider adoption? Um, so, so I just kind of highlighted it through that lens. A very important um, piece right there. And I, and that's definitely a topic that we get into it at Refit, of course, with a lot of the data work that we do um, and, and being able to partner with folks and including, we've worked with LeanPath, for instance, and figuring out those ways that um, 
you can get data to be you know, sufficiently aggregated and anonymized so that it can be useful in informing other work, uh, but still protecting client confidentiality or different site confidentiality is um, very challenging, uh, but something I think that we can all be coming together to work on. And, the, and that takes us into a, an interesting kind of slightly different take on data and measurement. But, you know, we've all heard the saying, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, and when I think of that, my brain instantly goes to like, oh, did Lean Path come up with that? Um, <laughs> and so, Janet, you know, um, and, and this is especially true when it comes to, to preventing wasted foods, which is wasted food, which is why solutions like waste tracking, enhanced demand planning, markdown alert applications are three of our top 10 solutions as measured by GHG emissions reduction and net financial benefit. Um, and so Janet, as you, you kind of mentioned, um, and, and we certainly consider, you know, Lean Path is a pioneer in helping businesses, food service in particular, measure and therefore manage what would be waste. Um, how do you all think about waste tracking? Um, and tell us about how it goes beyond just being technology solution or process improvement and into that behavior change that I know you've called out, but we've actually heard, I think all the panelists now start to bring up behavior change as such a key component of this, that it's not just technology and data, but there's so much more to that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Lean Path was, was created um, with that adage in mind, you, you manage the things that you measure. Um, and in, in food service, food, understanding your food waste is a critical control point, right? If you don't understand your food waste, you can't make changes to prevent it. And if you're flying blind on that, that's a major gap in your operational efficiency. So that's sort of starting point number one. Um, make the invisible visible. And we do that literally with adding images to our food waste data as well, which can be um, really helpful in understanding the quality of the product and, and uncovering again, those root causes. But the measurement is just the first step. Um, so you need good data that you can rely on to understand your food waste opportunity. And then you need to make sure that that data can be actionable as we've all sort of talked about in the intro as well. Um, so. That's why uh, our method at Lean Path does provide granular data because um, if you have high level data on your food waste opportunities, you probably can't really put that into action. So the measurement is the first step. Um, we set a baseline at Lean Path, understanding your starting point. And many organizations now are making public commitments to their food waste reduction goals um, and then need to stand behind those with transparency and reporting. Um, and, that, and that's our focus on the measurement side. Um, but then creating those operational efficiencies, finding opportunities where you can understand, um, could this product have been repurposed? Should we change purchasing in some way? Um, do we need to look at production um, efficiency? So turning that data into action, um, our systems focus on making that super simple because we know that there's no time, there's no labor to be spent um, kind of figuring that out on your own. So we identify what are your top wasted food items that are gonna have the greatest impact financially, um, environmentally that you should focus on. Um, our systems can help you set a smart goal around that, track your progress to, toward that goal, because we know that you need to focus to start making some of these changes that will lead to that 50% reduction in waste. Um, so it's really all about the organizational commitment that this is something that you wanna do starts with a high level target and then in the kitchen, operationalizing that and making people understand how can I have an impact? What are the things that I can do that will help us reach that bigger goal, breaking it down into smaller bite-sized pieces? Yeah, I would imagine that you know, full team buy-in is probably very important when you're implementing something like that. And, and Matt Seklick, I'd imagine this comes up in the retail operations as well, as well, that it can't just be, you know, someone from the top saying, this is something that we're doing, but that folks really have to be engaged and, and excited about this type of work. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, sustainability needs to be a part of the implementation plan of any of these solutions. Uh, how we're going to keep them going down the line and ensure, you know, consistent data collection uh, or whatever is feeding these systems. Wonderful. And Matt Schwartz, I know you were talking about kind of, you know, really building this brain and having this similarly holistic approach. Again, it's not just this, you know, pointed technology solution. Can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, how y'all are shifting this paradigm of fresh ordering for your customers and partners? Yeah, 
historically, I think there were, you know, going back 30 years, solutions built for grocers or retailers of any kind that were built to use computer assisted ordering, computer generated orders to optimize the quantity of food that would go into a store. But the approach taken historically was very modular, where you would have one system that was used to track what's called the perpetual inventory and try to track every single piece of food going into the store, every piece going out, any piece that's wasted, any piece that's damaged, and effectively throw a ton of labor at maintaining a perfect perpetual inventory. And to Matt Seklecki's point just now, the adherence to those systems historically has been frankly, abysmal. It's been very bad. And the next component is a demand forecast using some kind of algorithm to understand some prediction of how many berries am I going to sell um, during a window of time going forward. And then you need to run an optimization to interact the inventory, the demand forecast, the shipment frequency of when the trucks are coming in, how big your display is. Do you have a second ter- or even tertiary third display of berries? What price are you running it at? And is it available at your distribution center? And somehow all of those disparate systems. And then finally, actually, I'd give a, a produce manager or a meat manager in the store a Telzon gun or some kind of stand gun that doesn't work that well and expect it all to come together. I love that Matt is, is, is smiling, smiling here. Um, and expect that miraculously these modular disparate systems that rely on that think they're accurate, but don't really know when they are or are not accurate. Some computers are sentient um, and then provide what ultimately comes to be recommendations or prescriptive actions that are junk and that don't get adherence. And so that's why a bunch of food businesses revert back to manual decisions, gut decisions that end up actually being way better than whatever the technology historically can do. That's a long preamble to say that the paradigm shift in approach that we made was to unify all of those modular systems and to be a bit more humble. And specifically what I mean by that is not try to fully automate away all the inventory tracking and demand forecasting and decision-making, but rather think about giving power tools to the boots on the ground teams like produce managers, meat managers, deli managers, et cetera, that enable them to adhere to easy to use practices, easy to adhere to steps that in turn drive consistent decisions that are then powered by the AI and the computer intelligence. And so distilling all of that, I think the big insight we had was that a unified approach that keeps the human in the loop and lets them use his or her judgment to make a better decision, augmented by the cutting edge of AI and this technology that we now have, presents an opportunity to build a custom approach for fresh food that actually works and drives sustained good decisions at scale across even really big food businesses. And yeah, I also love seeing Matt Seklicki <laughs> responding to that, but um, <laughs> coming around to you, Matt Seklicki, and if there's anything you wanted to add on to, to the experience of that, because I'm, I'm sure it's difficult being in the retail setting and having to navigate all those components. Um, but I but I am also curious to hear um, about how Giant Eagle has been piloting a markdown alert application across a bunch of your locations in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and you know why you chose to pilot that and what that experience has been like so far. Good question. Uh, yeah, that's right. So earlier this year, we partnered with Flash Food to pilot their Markdown Alert application. And uh, it allows us to post items nearing their expiration date for sale at a reduced retail, uh, which customers can browse and purchase via the Flash Food mobile app. Uh, So one of the principal reasons that we chose the solution is how well it fits in with our current processes. Uh, We're able to continue with our in-store Markdown program while offering an additional way to connect with new and existing customers uh, who you know share our goal of eliminating food waste or uh, those who just like getting a great deal, right? So we've had a lot of success so far with the program and uh, we are planning to expand to additional locations in the next few months. Awesome. So, uh, you know, also 
you know, to, to some of Matt's, Matt Schwartz's points earlier. Uh, I think anyone who's worked in the grocery industry can relate to uh, having a Telzon gun that didn't work uh, trying to write their order, right? So uh, I think that's something that we can all relate to. And it points to, uh, you know, the technological, the, the commitment to investing in technology uh, to help make our team members' jobs easier. Uh, you know, as a company that's over 80 years old, we have lots of legacy systems uh, that can sometimes hinder us from obtaining key insights. So we, you know, as an organization, uh, we can see the benefits offered by, uh, you know, holistic integrated solutions. Um, in, in down that path, we're currently in uh, implementing a multi-year enterprise resource management platform uh, that is going to hopefully allow us to further optimize our product management understanding uh, and ability. Awesome. And then, Trevor, coming over to you, you know, from a capital provider perspective, what do you look for in a solution offering when you're considering funding and how are you assessing potential impact, including if you're looking at, you know, finances first or other, you know, climate, societal, different kinds of impacts as well? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just to riff on what, what I heard the mats just discuss now, because I think it's relevant to that question, is, you know, how do we really think about impact and through the lens of a client, and then reconcile that with emerging technologies and all these great new cutting edge ways to solve a problem, right? Um, so just if you use Matt's example of sort of a, an iterative or staggered approach towards adoption, um, that's something we see a lot in ag tech. So I think it's a, it's a fitting analogy here um, where farmers are, are just outcome driven. They're, they're, they want a technology that can prove an outcome and that will get them to adopt it. So more often times than not, um, this means a stepwise approach or easing, easing into the hot tub of, of innovation um, where they're not gonna have a fully automated experience tomorrow. Um, but the tools that can get them, you know, one inch closer to that are going to be the ones that help legacy companies and to, to Matt, uh, the other Matt's <laughs> point, um, kind of, you know, fix or in, improve some of the legacy systems that are potentially holding us back. Um, so, so really just understanding that fit in terms of our clients, because we do work with a lot of legacy uh, teams as well. So, so we don't bite off more than we can chew. We introduce something that's easily understood and, and easily adopted, but more, most importantly, that is outcome driven. So can it demonstrate a viable outcome in a, in a succinct period of time? Um, you know, my, my team kind of takes that back several steps in our evaluation process where we kind of try and define um, impact in terms of more, um, I guess, nuanced c components of your team. Some, some of those relate to, you know, the diversity of your team, your business model itself, and your, your ability to collaborate across our vast industry, uh, our vast network of clients. Um, and of course, the stage of growth that you're at, but those, I think, are all kind of layered into the overarching kind of viewpoint that, that I provided up top. Wonderful. And then, you know, after you guys have been investing, um, what, what do you consider success when you're looking back on something or, or evaluating at mid-stage? Yeah, so, I mean, for us, as we, we recognize that the most prolific startups, the most prolific companies are ones that have uh, the capacity to grow or learn. Um, so potentially algorithms that um, with broader adoption have broader maturity, broader use case applicability, so on the client side, if that means they can provide value um, at different points within the value chain, as opposed to, you know, at one point, it, uh, you know, a post-harvest technology that now can also be applied midstream or um, data aggregation tech on farm that has direct ties to the consumer, for instance, um, or sustainability metrics that are um, uh, top of mind for the end user consumer. Um, these are really the most, I think, successful use case examples that we have. 
ultimately, if if the company, if these companies that we support can become clients of the bank, that's like I guess an overarching goal. But really, that's that uh, broad application is really what we what we look for um, and and hope for. Wonderful. And then another one just for the, the whole group, so feel free to jump in. Um, you know, we've talked about just some of the solutions that Refit has identified as ways to refine product management and especially talking about y'all you know, specific solutions. Um, but what are some of the other you know, solutions or innovations that we're seeing emerging to improve product management processes that you're most excited about? Um, and, and Matt and, and Janet, I'll ask about y'all specific within your companies too, but um, what else is out there in the sector right now that you're seeing? I'd say there's a proliferation of data. You know, I'm obsessed with fresh food, so I'm just going to be a, a broken record on fresh, but uh, there's a really cool proliferation of data in the ecosystem that's happening, be it digitization and understanding of cold chain compliance, to uh, digitization and understanding as best we can of shelf life. You see tools that like use spectroscopy to measure the shelf life of a piece of perishable fruit or the sweetness of it internally without invasively cutting it open and do that at scale. And I think as new data like that emerges around shelf life or around quality or around other attributes, it'll feed systems like ours, but others as well to make better and better decisions. So the trend that gets me really excited is this proliferation of data within the fresh food space that historically had been missing. And then my aspiration would be that a fresh will be the brain or the operating system that can make use of a lot of that information to in turn drive better action and lower waste, higher profits for these food businesses. And I would, yeah, I would just add to that, like the nu nutrition, nutrition component. So are, is there an element of that data aggregation that relates to uh, nu nutrient at attenuation um, for whole produce, for instance, um, then therefore, you know, we're starting to demonstrate that continuity um, between the, in between the value chain. So yeah, I would agree with Matt there on that. It's, it's what we get really excited about. We see throughout different um, parts of the industry um, really understand that as well, just from a culture perspective. Interesting. I would just add that we're really excited about just the depth of solutions available in the food waste um, space today, which is very different than when Lean Path started, um, you know, over a decade ago. So. Um, the focus and the amount of innovation and investment that's going into this now is, is super positive. Um, even emerging competitors, right? We view that as a positive because it's gonna take, um, it's gonna take a lot of resource to make our, our vision for a sustainable future uh, become a, a reality. So the Insights Engine, just I guess a shout out to that because um, our company had a lunch and learn diving into the Insights Engine. A lot of our customers who are focused on prevention say, what else can we, should we be doing? And I think that's just a great repository and a way to pr provide guidance to customers on um, what else they can do. Yeah, and Trevor, or um, Matt said, like anything um, in particular that you're noticing just kind of like being in the retail sector, kind of more in this client seat of the solutions? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of exciting stuff coming online. Uh, we want to try all of it. And I think sometimes we're limited by our, uh, our resources, our IT resources, the technology that we have in the stores. And uh, I think we're constantly looking for uh, better solutions. And uh, I think, you know, to, to um, on something Trevor said uh, that, you know, we wanted to be able to prove results in some period of time and to be able to, uh, you know, test and implementing a, a, a solution in uh, one or more locations and see that it, you know, can perform. And then Janet and Matt Schwartz, um, are there any new products that you've 
are getting ready to launch or have been launching recently. I know there's a lot that happened um, over COVID, even while things were going a little crazy uh, that you want to share with us. I can't at this moment, I've, I've been coached not to share uh, or to break news uh, yet, but we have new products coming that I'm, I'm very excited about as we proliferate across all of Fresh at the store level and also move up the supply chain to inject intelligence for other decisions as well. The one thing I can say that is really exciting for us is that we're growing a ton um, already live in hundreds of stores and growing tenfold over the next several kind of the next kind of window of time here. So um, we're just really excited to be pushing the technology out to more and more stores, more and more retailers and, and reduce millions and millions of pounds of food waste. Janet, what about at LeanPath? Yeah, we're constantly kind of thinking about innovation, feedback from customers, ways to make food waste tracking easier to make the data more useful. Um, threw everybody for a huge loop and food service was blown up in terms of what it, what it looked like. Um, and so the transition to grab and go specifically and individually wrapped items, we said, how can we make it really easy to track your food waste? So um, we created a solution that tracks by eaches. Traditionally, we sort of track by weight. Um, and we call that Lean Path Go. Uh, we've also designed a lot of sort of lightweight solutions for smaller operations, because I think historically there was the belief that automated food waste tracking was for big operations and it doesn't need to be. We can make it really easy and accessible to smaller food service operations as well. So we've designed um, a number of different kind of trackers, we call them, that enable that food waste tracking and make it really easy at the front line and also attainable from a financial perspective. Um, and yeah, making, making a lot of progress on our uh, analytics dashboards, specifically finding ways to how can we make the photos more powerful um, and some other exciting um, things that we'll be releasing soon as well. And, and that second product is Lean Path Scout, you said? Yeah, we have um, the first one I mentioned tracking by each is, is called Lean Path Go. Um, and we also introduced during COVID Lean Path Scout, which is a lighter weight integrated tracking solution um, that Sodexo is actually rolling out globally in our partnership um, for Waste Watch powered by LeanPath. Wonderful. And I, I think that accessibility point you, you bring up there is really important because um, these solutions are incredibly powerful. And while we need all the big players involved, they make up a, a big portion of you know the market share you know whether it's retail or food service or restaurants that we're talking about who are really influencing our, our food system but there's also you know hundreds and thousands of smaller operators who need these solutions too so i think as we you know refine and improve our solutions whether it's within product management or really across the solution set um, that we're all working with them. We need to be mindful about how we're making sure accessibility for those operators, um, as well as thinking about how we keep, um, you know, our, our smaller cities and counties involved in our, our rural areas. So I think that accessibility component is going to be increasingly important um, and, and thinking about how we scale and keep those folks involved. Um, it's going to be really special. Um, so we've got just a, a couple more minutes here. So I want to Let's see, Trevor, I want to uh, throw one more over at you. Um, from your perspective, what types of financing are needed to help scale some of these solutions and how can different stakeholders, you know, whether it's ecosystem players like Refed or, you know, some of our peers like Closed Loop, found, closed loop Partners or maybe more catalytic investors who can, you know, take more, you know, longer time horizons or bigger risk. Um, help mobilize capital into this space? You know, what, what can we be doing? Uh, you know, I mentioned some pretty big numbers at the beginning, billions of dollars. Uh, how do we make that happen? Um, great question. <laughs> um, I, I think that it, it starts with a conversation, right? Um, I think for, for the, the, the folks that are on the entrepreneur side, the folks that are on the thought leadership side of, of the equation, um, they're, they're doing a really good job at that. I think on the financing side, it's really about understanding that return that you pointed out. And I've seen some recently 
um, as it relates to some of the work that we're doing um, that's really powerful as well in, in terms of ROI. But where are those points of synergy between different stages of growth, for instance, or different sets of priorities um, within financing? So um, how can we as organizations do a better job of uh, communicating why an earlier stage, a growth stage company is an integral part of you know, a, a company's you know, broader investment strategy or how can we bring in companies that um, may represent a future um, position for, for the industry that, that are just not ready for prime time. And, and that's a pretty high bar for a lot of those companies. So how can we help those companies understand that we need to be looking a little bit um, below the bar for lack of a better word? Um, and create those synergies um, out there so that so that we can have truly patient capital and support really strong ideas that that need uh, a little bit of time to mature. Wonderful and, I, and I'm glad you mentioned patient capital. I think that's something that is shockingly hard to come by sometimes but so important when we're thinking about these solutions and especially thinking about a food system where things take time <laughs> to, right. to grow and get going. Um, but we're getting close to the end of this very, very fun hour. Um, and I have one final question for each of you. If people walk away from this discussion today, learning, you know, one thing or, you know, having one key on lock, uh, what, what do you guys want that to be? You know, what do you want them to take away from this? And uh, we'll, Janet, we'll start with you again. Yeah, I think I would say uh, don't overlook prevention. So uh, find ways to make the invisible visible. We think that starts by measuring food waste. Um, and if you're at an organization that's in a place to make a set a target to reduce their food waste um, and align with the SDG 12.3 initiative to cut food waste in half by 2030, set a target, start there um, and don't overlook prevention. Awesome, Matt Schwartz. We've gotten really, really, really good at growing a lot of calories, processing it into foods, distributing it to people. Um, you know, famine, whole, these problems exist, but in the US and the large part around the world, the biggest problems we have are that of obesity, overweightedness, and paradoxically malnutrition at the same time. Uh, for those reasons, I think that increasing access to fresh food while doing so with the limited environmental resources and the existing climate change that happens is one of the most pressing things that we need to do um, to both better the future of our planet and the health of people. And I think that focusing on fresh first technology, given that new wave within our food system is the best thing we can do to improve human and environmental health. Awesome. Matt Seklecki. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as the retailer perspective on the panel, uh, just that, you know, we're looking for easy to implement low cost solutions to, you know, that fit into our current operations and workflows uh, that will allow us to continue to reduce costs and uh, eliminate food waste and, um, you know, and all those solutions that, you know, we're, we're open to adopting new ones. Awesome. And Trevor. Yeah, and I would just add, just to capstone my talking point so far is, I think collaboration of every sort is what's needed to drive that continuity that I've been speaking towards. So um, strange bedfellows, large and small, uh, I think should think of each other as allies in, in an effort to drive impact. Um, and, and really create tech that can be deployed easily and seamlessly. Awesome. Well, I want to thank all of our fabulous panelists, Janet, Matt, Matt, and Trevor for their insights and perspectives. It was terrific learning about the work you are all doing to help reduce food waste, and we appreciate you joining us today. I also want to thank all of you out there from across the nation, and I think I saw some folks uh, across the world as well for taking time out of your busy days to join us. As a follow-up, we will be sending out an email with a link to today's recording um, of this installment, along with some highlights from our discussion. So we'll be pulling out some, some key um, call-outs and CTAs from the conversation. 
And remember, this was the third installment of our seven part series digging into the key action areas of ReFed's roadmap to 2030. Our next installment is on August 25th, mark your calendars. It focuses on the fourth key action area of the roadmap to 2030, which is maximizing product utilization. Lots of waste is driven by not using food products in their entirety. So how can facilities, operations, and menus be designed to use as much of each product as possible? And how are upcycling and low waste menus designed, menus helping the food system rethink the concept of waste? Our guest moderator will be Jonathan Deutsch, who is a professor at Drexel University and director of the Drexel Food Lab. And our other speakers will include Liron Akavia from SIBO and Turner Wyatt from the Upcycled Food Association. We've added the registration link in the chat box, so please register if you haven't done so already. And if you have any questions or feedback, please reach out to us at insights at refed.com. And finally, if you'd like events like this and are looking for other ways to increase your engagement with refed and others from across the food system, sign up for our new refed food waste action network. It's all about working together to reach our 2030 food waste reduction goal, just like Trevor said so perfectly. And we're excited to have you be a part of it. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day.